Uh, good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, share with you about how to live beyond 100 years. I hope that you'll find this uh, uh, an interesting uh, talk. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'm Dr. Michael Lim, and uh, I will now go straight into the slides. Okay, so today's topic is on how to live beyond 100 years. And uh, I would like to share with you, it's something that is quite achievable by most people. Uh, it's really not too difficult to do so, uh, given the uh, advances in uh, medicine today. So how do you join the Centenarian Club? The good news is that if you look at the trend over the last several decades, the number of centenarians is increasing. So more and more people are becoming centenarians. And I would like to share with you that all of you are eligible to join the Centenarian Club. Now, uh, it has uh, been thought that it's due to genes, but in reality, this longevity is not just influenced by genes alone, but also by the environment and the lifestyle. And just to give you an example of the impact on the environment, if we use Italy as an example, you find that the life expectancy at birth has been increasing primarily because of advances in medicine, uh, improvement of the environment, especially clean and safe water and food. So you find that expectancy went from 29 to 82 years over this period of time in Italy. And the number of centenarians jumped from 165 to more than 15,000 over a span of about uh, 60 years. And part of it is due to the reduction of infectious diseases and therefore less deaths. And uh, for those who died young, less than 60 years of age, you'll be surprised that almost three quarters in 1872 compared to less than 10% in 2011. And in the last uh, couple of decades, the extension of lifespan was due primarily to advances in medicine, especially with regards to cardiovascular disease, which means heart attack and stroke and, and also cancer. So in the last five years, we, are, we have last two decades, we've increased it by five years and last 10 years by two years. Now, uh, the most interesting thing is that these people who live very long, they have little in common with one another in education, income, or profession. In other words, everybody out there is eligible to become part of the Centenarian Club. Uh, but they do share certain similarities uh, which reflect their lifestyles. So what are they? So firstly, these are people who are more sociable. They have uh, close relationships with their family members, uh, with their friends. And uh, you find that this uh, importance of uh, being uh, sociable and having family connections and friends is an important factor for their general well-being. Uh, and also that uh, they have this pre a preserved circadian rhythm. So they are able to sleep well. And in general, uh, as you grow older, sleep becomes more fragmented. However, uh, you generally need about seven hours plus and minus. So if you get about those number of hours of sleep, uh, then it's actually pretty good. And the important thing about these people is that they are easily contented. They have life satisfaction. Uh, they are not bothered if somebody does better than them. Uh, they are not bothered if somebody's house is bigger than theirs or is more successful than them they are satisfied and contented in life they don't get jealous they don't get angry at other people's successes so that's a very important fact that you are contented with yourself you sleep well uh, as i said earlier on you have attachment closeness uh, you are more friendly and you get along people better all these are important factors for longevity and easily achievable by anyone out there. So instead of the lifestyles of the rich and famous, here we are lifestyles of the centenarians, uh, non-smoker, uh, non-obese, but mind you, non-obese doesn't mean that you have to be thin because actually thin people do not do well, all right? As long as you're not obese, you're fine. 
and you cope well with stress. Uh, you do not get stressed easily. Uh, you are sociable and you sleep well, as I said. And good news for all the women there, mostly women. And they have healthy habits. They eat well. Uh, they are less likely to get all these problems related to chronic illnesses, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. So how, what is important of genes in human longevity? So if you look at the signs of it, you find that 25% of the variation in human lifespan is determined by your genes. All right? You don't need to know the details, but there are certain genes that are important. And uh, from genealogy studies, where they've looked at hundreds of millions of births and deaths, they, are, they find that actually the factors that are passed down from generation to generation explain about 7% of the difference between one's lifespan and another's. And actually, the genetic contribution is even smaller. So do not be disheartened. A lot of it actually is not purely genes, all right? And uh, other things like economic mobility and other non-genetic contributions to lifespan, such as your education, income, access to health care, uh, makes a difference. And therefore, it does pay to pick your parents because of the non-genetic inheritance. So what is important with respect to the genes is that really uh, genes are important once you reach 100 years old. That is actually the important part of the genes. So if you have family members who are centenarians, then generally the genes do also, and the environment also help you to reach that long lifespan as well. So if your siblings or children or centenarian parents, it's a bonus for you. And hooray to all the women. Uh, all of them are wonder women because women generally live much longer than men because of social factors and also biological factors. So you just now you look at the chart that I referred to about centenarians, you find that although the number of centenarians are going up, they are largely women and less of it is men, mostly women. So women generally do much better. And part of the reason is because of the sex hormones. So people have found that if you remove the sex hormones at your young age, it increases the lifespan in mammals and even in humans based on data from Korean units. And uh, well, the testosterone helps you in your muscle growth. People believe that it tends to reduce your immune response. So that could also be a factor. And we know that, uh, for example, like prostate cancer in men, if you cut off the testosterone supply, actually the cancer gets better. All right. So the male hormones do have a detrimental effect sometimes. But uh, beyond uh, the social factors, environmental factors, that the other genes that are important are those that have to do with your heart disease, stroke, and diabetes, all right? Your cholesterol level. And uh, people have found that uh, for those who live long, uh, there's a reduction in genetic risk for arterial disease like heart and stroke. Alzheimer's disease, blood pressure problems, um, cholesterol problems, kidney disease, and bone density as well. And they generally have lower blood pressure. So if you have lower blood pressure, that's a good thing because then you're less likely to get a heart attack or stroke. So if you look at this study on Chinese centenarians, you find that firstly, they don't smoke too much, uh, not many drink alcohol, and uh, don't be surprised, most of them are not on any medication. And very few have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. That means lung disease due to smoking, very little, all right? And if you look at the blood pressure values, the blood pressure, the upper and lower one, you see that only a small minority have elevated blood pressures, all right? Only a small minority. And not only that, you look at the sugar levels, uh, only a small minority have elevated sugars. A large number of them, the sugar levels are also very good. So um, what is also important is that even if they get these diseases, they tend to get them at the later stage in life. So when they are 105 years, they are more like people in their 80s or 90s. So you find that uh, they don't, 
they don't eat excessively and don't become obese. So they are a little bit like people who are calorie restricted in their profile. And this seems to affect their molecular genetic response, affects their genes, all right, and uh, helps to improve the lifespan as well. And one of the diets that seem to do very well uh, and helps is the Mediterranean diet, which is primarily a diet uh, with lots of nuts and vegetables, plant-based diet, and less of uh, meat and uh, carbs as well. Now, uh, in addition to your chronological age, there's what we call a biological age, and this thing is called an epigenetic clock, which is the way the genes are expressed. And uh, what happens as we grow older, there is a chemical reaction called DNA methylation, which actually affects the genes. So what it does is it doesn't change the genes, it just silences the genes or makes the genes active. So some of the genes are made silent. So in the uh, supercentenarians, they find that the brain and the muscle are generally younger than most people. And because of the ability to switch off some genes, it makes them look biologically younger and able to reduce the risk of age-related problems like cancer, osteoarthritis, and neurodegeneration. So in summary, if you look at uh, human longevity, uh, these are the important factors. I think uh, most of us have access to clean water, food, uh, good living conditions, uh, good control of infectious diseases, and access to healthcare. Uh, these are something that you manage yourself, don't smoke. Uh, you don't need to be super thin, but as long as you're not obese, you're fine. Uh, don't get stressed out by everything. Uh, learn to be sociable, have friends, uh, spend time with your family, uh, eat well, and uh, do exercises, and sleep well. You need about seven hours on the average. Uh, and if you have a family history, you're blessed. If you're female, definitely you, are, you have, have a plus above the males, and uh, definitely uh, it's important to reduce the risk of heart disease, and you're biologically younger uh, for the genes for people who have uh, family members or centenarians. So the most important determinants of longevity, uh, what it shows is that uh, the genes are very important uh, for those who are super centenarians, all right? When, all right, okay. But really, First, the first barrier to cross is the first 80 years of your life. And in the first 80 years of your life, lifestyle is actually the most important. So in other words, all of you are eligible for the, to be members of the Centenarian Club because lifestyle is the biggest determinant of whether you be, can become a centenarian. So I think you know this about eating well, not drinking too much, exercising, avoiding smoking. And the genes really become important only you go beyond your 80s, all right? So that is where the genes are. So firstly, the first thing is focus on getting to the first 80 years of age, and then the genes are important uh, subsequently. So if you look at uh, the main cause of death, uh, not uh, in the population, heart disease and stroke seems to be the main causes of death. Uh, cancers as well. But once you hit about 80s, the main cause of death in, is really heart disease and stroke. So I think if you can, uh, heart disease and stroke are intertwined and really if you can prevent it, then you can actually first reach the hurdle of 80 years old. And even then if you cross that, heart disease and stroke are the main killer. So if you can prevent this, really you're on the path to becoming a centenarian. So many, many people ask the question, so I have no symptoms. So does it mean that I have no heart disease? Does it mean that I can, uh, I'm fine, I'm not going to get a heart attack? Well, uh, if you look at the Singapore data, uh, every year you have about uh, 1,000 cases of people dying suddenly from a heart cardiac arrest. And uh, every day about three people die suddenly. So that's not a small number, all right? And the important thing to note that is that a large number of them have no chest pain and have no warning signs. Uh, if you look at the US data, about half of men who die of sudden heart attack death do not have symptoms and two thirds of women do not have prior warning. Uh, and in a recent report in Singapore uh, done by uh, insurance company and uh, published 
couple of months ago in the China News Asia, about 70% of men, of people who have heart attacks did not have prior warning. And again, they are different from men and women. Men are more typical in their symptoms. When they exert themselves, they either suddenly feel short of breath or they have this tightness or squeezing sensation over their chest, or they may have tightness over the jaw or neck, all right? Women have less specific symptoms. Uh, they may not have chest pain, all right? They may have abdominal discomfort. They may have indigestion, extreme fatigue, nausea and vomiting. Uh, generally less specific compared to men. And uh, it's important to know what's the mechanism of a person dying suddenly. One is uh, what we call a seizure, where the heart goes into a fit with irregular rhythm as compared to a normal rhythm and the heart just quivers and cannot pump anymore. Or if your artery is blocked and then therefore there's no blood supply and the heart cannot pump anymore and the muscle dies, pump failure. So, and a pump, uh, a heart attack can also lead to ventricular fibrillation as well. So the important thing is to prevent a heart attack. So contrary to common beliefs, most people think that you must have a very severe block to get a heart attack. But actually, most heart attacks are not due to severe narrowing. That might come as a surprise to you that less than 70 less than 70 percent narrowing are found in 85 percent of people heart attacks, and two thirds of those heart attacks do not have a significant narrowing. So what's the mechanism? So if you look at the background of this slide, you see a cross section of the heart blood vessels. You see this purple thing, that's a huge blood clot there blocking the artery. And you look at the wall, that's what we call cholesterol deposit plug and fibrous tissue. But you look at this whiter part here. The whiter part here is actually cholesterol. So when you have soft cholesterol deposit in the wall of the heart, it makes it easier for the lining to tear. Just like if you've got blister on your skin, the skin will break off easily. Similarly for the heart artery, it will break off easily. But if you tear the lining of the heart artery, it's like as if you cut yourself. What happens when you cut yourself? You form a clot. The body forms a clot to seal the cut. So similarly, the body forms a huge clot to seal the artery. And it is this clot that causes a heart attack. So if you look at this illustration, you start off by forming cholesterol inside inside the wall. Just mind you, some people think like it's putting butter and kaya on top of your bread. It is not really that. It's actually deposit inside the wall. And if you accumulate enough cholesterol and the pressure across this is high due to exercise, or it's like when you open the tap and put your finger across it, the pressure is very high and that can cause the lining to tear. So when you tear the lining, the body thinks that you've cut yourself, it will form a clot to repair itself. And this is a clot that causes a heart attack. So how do you make it impossible to get a heart attack? All right. Firstly, you need to identify risk factors, early detection, and accurate tests. So risk factors that can be modified. So calcium supplements. A lot of people are taking calcium or drinking very high calcium milk or foods which are highly fortified calcium, not knowing that the calcium supplements can actually increase your risk of heart attack and even stroke itself. Uh, because excessive amounts of calcium intake can result in precipitation or deposits of calcium in the arteries. So what it means is that uh, do not take calcium supplements unless the doctor thinks it's absolutely necessary. Uh, but it is absolutely fine to take foods which are not which are the normal sort of foods which contain calcium, which have not been fortified or supplemented. Uh, because dietary calcium from foods is generally safe. Smoking, I need not say more, is definitely not, uh, it's really a time bomb. And I won't go into too much of diabetes, uh, except to note that uh, in diabetes, uh, once you have it, your risk increases across the board. Uh, but today, uh, we do not have time to discuss this, maybe another time, but uh, there are diabetic drugs that just lower the sugar, but there are newer generation diabetic drugs that not only the sugar, but prevents you from getting a heart attack, reduces your risk of stroke, and also protects the kidney, all right? This will be a separate talk by itself. And uh, the most important factor that mo most of us need to pay attention to is what we call the LDL, or bad cholesterol. And uh, 
uh, this bad cholesterol can come from the diet or from genes. So you have genes that predispose you to a very high level of cholesterol. Definitely, uh, that is something that needs to be treated. And it could also be from the food that you take. So for those of you who love uh, hawker food like cha kwe tiao and uh, mi goreng, look at the amount of cholesterol per serving. Extremely high levels, all right? Uh, much higher than even your black pepper crab or even your KFC chicken thigh. If you think that you can eat as much as you want and burn it off with exercise, unfortunately, the real truth is exercise is not going to have a major, major impact on your LDL. On your LDL. Uh, so it is important to lower the LDL. And uh, a lot of people still talk about good cholesterol HDL, but just to let you know that over the more than last 10 years, there are at least four large studies with Jeff increased the HDL by 100%, but have shown no benefit. So this HDL is not discussed anymore. It's not really a good cholesterol. That concept is obsolete. So we just need to focus on the LDL, which is a bad cholesterol. And many people are giving cholesterol-lowering tablets called statins. And we know that for every one millimole or 40 milligrams, about 40 milligrams of cholesterol that you lower, all right, you can reduce uh, stroke and heart attack by about 22% and death by about 10%. Uh, we, need, we need just to be aware that cholesterol is not a uniform type of uh, particle. So LDL, for example, the bad one, there are seven types, some bigger, some smaller, and the smaller ones are usually the most harmful ones. But what's important to note is that you look at all the studies about cholesterol lowering and you find that even with cholesterol lowering using tablets such as statins, there is still a residual risk of getting heart attack. And it's as high as 40 to 70% in most of these studies. So in other words, just taking the tablets alone don't solve the problem. So now, um, over the last uh, years, uh, there are better medicines, like for example, this PCSK9 inhibitor, which is an injectable medicine. What it does is that the liver is a very efficient remover of cholesterol. So when blood flows through the liver, uh, these liver have these what we call receptors. They capture the cholesterol and they bring it to the liver to degrade the cholesterol. So the more the liver can do, the more cholesterol can be removed from the body. So these drugs increase the efficiency of removal. Uh, currently, they are given about once every fortnight, but uh, a newer generation is about to come out to the market probably next year where you only need one injection once in six months. So in future, it's not difficult to bring your cholesterol down to very low levels, and that will further decrease your risk of heart attack and stroke. And when you remove your cholesterol, the plug becomes very stable and therefore it's unlikely to tear and unlikely to cause a heart attack. Blood pressure. So blood pressure, we all know that blood pressure can cause stroke, vision loss, heart failure. And therefore it's important to actually lower your blood pressure. Uh, why is it important to uh, control your risk factors? Because if you get a cardiac arrest, even in very good countries with well-equipped uh, healthcare facilities and services, the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, the survival is very, very low. So even in the US, you look at this, survival is extremely low. All the more important is better to prevent rather than to get a heart attack and try to save yourself. As you can see, when you go to the or see your doctors, there's a whole barrage of tests that they can do to test your heart. So which test should you do? Which test is appropriate for you? So there's something that if you are armed with the knowledge, you can make the right decisions. Generally, the tests that we do are what we call non-invasive tests. In other words, we don't stick a tube into your, into your arteries, uh, into your heart, to try to figure out whether you have blocked arteries. So they can broadly be divided in two groups. Functional tests. Functional tests means you can assess the function of the heart, but you cannot see the heart arteries. So these are tests which are like treadmill, stress echo, nuclear perfusion. So what you're trying to do is look at the flow of the artery and whether it's providing enough blood to the heart muscle. That's the theory behind these tests. Then you have the other group of tests which allows you to see the heart arteries. So you have the CT, 
and the MR CT, which is a form of X-ray. MR use magnetic magnetic resonance imaging, uh, but this is not really available, and we use it mainly for those who are uh, childbearing young people in which we want to avoid radiation. The treadmill test is the most important. So you have people coming to see me and telling me that okay, they have. Their husband has been uh, going for their regular screen every year for the last 20 years and have passed every treadmill test with flying colors but had died suddenly of a massive heart attack. Why is that so? Because treadmill is not 100%. Uh, for if you take 100 patients with one significant artery, uh, one artery that's significantly blocked, about 60% will have abnormal tests, means about 40% will not have that test. So all you can tell a patient who's got a negative treadmill is that the risk of getting a heart attack is lower. You cannot tell the patient that uh, there's no significant block, all right? But it is easily available and inexpensive. So another type of test is a stress echo where the doctor uses an ultrasound to image the heart and look at the heart function. And then they will either increase your heart rate by a medicine or on a treadmill. And the theory is that by stressing the heart, if your heart artery is blocked, then that part of the muscle doesn't get enough blood flow, so it will not pump as well as other parts. Uh, the problem for it is also very operate dependent. And uh, again, uh, I will explain to you the accuracy of this test. Another test is a nuclear test. So they inject a radioactive isotope uh, that goes to the body and then it is, is taken up by the muscle. Same concept, they stress either with medicine or with exercise before and after. And then they try to assess whether uh, the radiation is spread evenly across the muscle or less in some parts of the muscle due to a blockage. Uh, mind you, uh, if you are young and you are uh, childbearing, this is not a very good test because uh, radiation is passed from head to toe and in compared to some of uh, the other modalities, uh, the radiation dose can be quite high in certain situations. And uh, don't forget, uh, unlike an x-ray, which is a snapshot over a segment of your body, a part of the body, uh, this radiation dose passes through your body and it takes time for the radioactive isotope to leave your body. So you cannot see the blood vessels, but you can only see the uh, images here as the radioactive isotopes. Uh, a stud, these are some of the data. Uh, and to show you that uh, if you look at all the studies done, uh, the sensitivity and specificity is written here. Uh, positive, negative predictive value, positive predictive value. So if we say that you don't have an artery that is blocked, but actually you have it, uh, and you do uh, the test, the negative predictive value is not 100%. You may actually miss, all right? So none of these tests are able to tell you with certainty that you don't have a blocked artery. So they all, you cannot visualize your arteries. Now, if you look at the direct test, such as CT choreangiogram, you can see your heart arteries. You can see it. So this is what it looks like. What is the test about? Uh, well, it's actually a non-invasive test that can be done within seconds, able to take high resolution 3D image of the heart within seconds. You need to line up for a minute or two. They prepare you and the scan takes roughly about five seconds or so. Yeah. And the nice thing about it, you can see exactly where the block is, uh, what percentage it is, whether it is soft or whether the calcium is hardened. So that is important because when you see that there's block in your heart, you're more likely to change your lifestyle. So in the uh, national healthcare system in the UK in 2016, uh, they have initiated this protocol in which this will be the first test of choice for anybody that goes there with chest pain, whether it is typical or atypical, uh, they will use this test. But of course, in the old days, it's 64 slides now, it is much, much more uh, advanced. Uh, this is one of the very early studies we published 15 years ago. Uh, we were one of the early centers in, in this part of the world to start this uh, service. And we were able to show a very high level of uh, positive predictive value and negative predictive value. All right, very, very high level. And that was in 15 years ago. Of course, now the, uh, the scanners are much better. 
So just to show you, for example, uh, using the newest generation scanner, uh, you can get very clear pictures of heart artery. We can cut a cross section. We can see where the plug is. We can tell you exactly what is soft or hardened. And in optimal scans with optimal patients, uh, the radiation dose can be as low as that of a mammogram. Uh, just be aware that not all CT angiograms are the same. Uh, some of the machines uh, do not produce such high resolution pictures and also the radiation dose can be quite significantly much higher. So some of the older scans, for example, X-ray radiation can be 10, 20 times uh, the current uh, newer scanners. The beauty about this is that you can visualize invisible plugs. What do I mean by this? Uh, because Sometimes after you have abnormal test, functional tests, uh, some doctors will ask you to do what we call an invasive chorea angiogram, all right? Which means they stick a plastic tube into your, either your groin or into your wrist and pass the tube to the heart arteries, all right? This is called invasive chorea angiography, all right? But when you inject contrast, you only see the lumen. You cannot see the wall. You cannot see the wall. Whereas with the CT, you see the lumen and you see the wall. So that's the difference between an uh, invasive coronary angiogram and a CT coronary angiogram, all right? That's the difference. Now, in the real world, if you look at the data from the U.S., where they looked at about more than 400,000 studies in the U.S. of angiograms, they find that almost 40% were normal. So actually, all these people did not need the scans in the first invasive uh, angiograms in the first place because they're normal. And only slightly more than one-third had uh, significant disease. In other words, two-thirds, this test could have been avoided if they did a CT angiogram instead. And the most amazing thing is that, you look at it, just now I showed you the uh, data on the non-invasive functional tests. And you would have thought that if it was abnormal, you would expect to see somewhere around 70 to 80% of these people having a significant arteries on the invasive angiogram. But in the real world is only 40%. So what that tells you is that actually the accuracy of the test in the functional test is highly variable and depends from center to center. It can vary quite significantly. All right. All right. So... In the, so actually, what would be wonderful if you could see the artery, then you can be sure. And mind you, the invasive scan and angiogram actually takes, uh, I mean, there's real risk. Uh, and there are at least about five prospective studies which show that where they do an MRI before and after the scan, and they find that up to 5 to 22% can get a silent stroke. You may not even know it, but you get a silent stroke. This will affect your memory. You can get heart attacks, you can put the tube up and can tear your lining, tear your aorta, or you can bleed and even die from it as well, all right? Although this is extremely rare. So I think uh, we can make it quite impossible to get a heart attack by firstly, control your risk factors. So the most important thing you need to is LDL, get it down, get it down. Healthy lifestyle means that eating well, eating properly, and also doing uh, exercise. Now, you need to choose the right test for your heart. And as I showed you just now, uh, different tests have different accuracies. So you can always discuss your doctor as to what works best for you. Now, why do I ask you to take adequate liquids daily? Because I showed you just now that most heart attacks are due to a blood clot. So why do people die in the early hours in the morning because after they sleep, by the time it's 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning, they're dry, they tear a plug, a clot forms, and they get a heart attack, all right? So if you drink at least 2 liters a day, it is the cheapest and the most inexpensive way to prevent a heart attack and stroke. So drink adequate amount of liquids daily. Now, if you have uh, multiple risk factors, you have chest pain, and you are very worried, then you can always seek the opinion of a cardiologist. And uh, again, uh, medication, uh, where it, wherever it's necessary, um, you may want to discuss, for example, in diabetics, while many uh, take uh, tablets that can lower sugar, not all of them can actually prevent uh, them from uh, preventing heart attack, preventing a stroke, and protecting the kidney. Now, uh, so, you know, all these centenarians, when they live very long, they have certain, certain 
physical attributes. And I just want to point out to you that about 80% have visual and hearing loss. So while you're still young, it's important for you to uh, get your eyes uh, checked to make sure that you do not allow uh, diseases like glaucoma to uh, affect your eye vision and uh, hearing. Uh, make sure that you do not subject your ears to extremely loud noises frequently to damage your ears. And there are other factors such as uh, cognitive status. So you find that one third have still quite good cognitive status. And one of the factors can, that can affect your cognitive status, especially your memory, is really your oxygen during sleep, what we call upper airway obstruction or obstructive sleep apnea. So if you snore or you have to, uh, you wake up dry mouth, you're tired all the time, uh, it may be that you're not getting enough oxygen when you sleep and you should see a doctor to get this addressed because uh, definitely it will help your quality of life. And vitamin D, D deficiency is also an important thing, but uh, you just need to make sure you take adequate amount of vitamin D. So what I'm saying is that uh, beyond your age, there is what we call healthy lifespan because you want to live healthily. So this concept of health span is very, very important. So you need to look up the cell, make sure that uh, as we grow old, we not only have long lives, but good quality lives, all right? So finally, I just want to say that uh, I welcome all of you to join the Centenarian Club entry criteria, not too difficult. All of you can meet the criteria. So firstly, as I said, healthy habits. Uh, which I described earlier, uh, eating well, sleeping well, uh, stop smoking, don't drink too much, uh, exercise, risk factor control here. I want to pay, make you pay attention to cholesterol. It's the single most important factor for those of you uh, who do not have uh, problems of diabetes. But if you have diabetes, talk to your doctors about getting the better drugs, which not only control your sugar but can prevent heart attack and stroke, reduce the risk of that happening and protect your kidney. And for those of you with high blood pressure, uh, make sure that it's well controlled. And arm yourself with knowledge because knowledge is important because as I showed you just now, uh, from treadmill tests to CT, there have been leaps and bounds in diagnostic information, how to uh, choose the right test that is, helps you make the right decision. And prevention is better than cure. So don't wait for the disease to happen because I showed you that uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest, the survival is extremely low. It's better to prevent it. Your odds are better. So prevention is better. And then you need to take the right decisions for health. If you're not sure, discuss with your doctor. So all of you are eligible to become uh, members of Centenarian Club. And uh, I welcome all of you to join me, uh, join us. And if you have any questions uh, with regards to this, uh, please feel free to uh, send us your questions. I'm happy to uh, assist you in answering your questions. And uh, last but not least, uh, stay safe and healthy and uh, join the Centenarian Club. Thank you all very much. Thank you all for listening to talk. And uh, as I said, if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to send us a question. Uh, and thank you all for this, uh, for listening. Thank you, Dr. Michael, for your sharing. So I believe there's a lot of questions. I saw it in the, in the question and answer box. So how we're going to do this, we're going to take all the questions at the end of the segment. Coming up next, we still have another two segments, one for ENT and one for the eye specialist. So without much further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Bayes Prasad to, to share next. When I look at his, wow, he's a senior consultant, head and neck surgeon, wow, multiple awards, even by Ng Ting Fong Hospital itself, even by MOH, if I'm correct, wow, served as, as a naval combat officer as well. So I think with his years of experience, he has an interest. He has a special interest in voice and swallowing disorder, pediatric, ontology, hope I got it right, oncology. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Bias 
it's your show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the slides, please. So, um, a very good afternoon to uh, everyone who is tuning in to this webinar, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you about uh, what I would put as aging gracefully beyond 100 years and the considerations uh, for the ear, nose, and throat in um, getting to the uh, 100 mark and beyond. Um, the interesting thing about ear, nose, and throat surgery is that bar of vision, the special senses seem to be very much the remit of the ENT surgeon. Uh, we look at hearing, balance, smell, and taste, and uh, these, these special senses are often taken for granted. But uh, they certainly wane as we age, and the rate at which they uh, wane depends very much on uh, the individual. And as Dr. Lim was saying, uh, many other factors such as genetics, the environment, and lifestyle. But there are other functions that ENT surgeons are also concerned with, uh, and that is voice, swallow, and also uh, sleep. So on your right-hand side, you have a poster of uh, the ear, the nose, and the throat. And we'll go through these three uh, uh, areas in, uh, in quick succession. And thereafter, we'll talk about how we can help as doctors in trying to get you to 100 and beyond uh, with as many of these faculties intact and working to enhance the quality of your life. A couple of uh, basic uh, features to do with aging is a term that we use in the uh, medical lexicon called senescence. And this is basically biological aging. And it involves the gradual deterioration of functional characteristics. And this particular deterioration is not programmed as opposed to another term we use, which is called apoptosis. And apoptosis effectively means that there is a clock in your cell or in your tissues that basically tells each and every one of these cells that it is time for them to die. Um, so apoptosis as an example would be the development of your fingers. For instance, if you uh, looked at the hand as it developed, the fingers started to separate and it's that separation of the fingers which is effectively the programmed cell death of the tissue in between them. And similarly, so the fact that your, your fingers don't keep growing forever is also a form of programmed cell death. They stay at that size once you have developed fully. So that's what apoptosis means. And the two pictures on the right-hand side are basically pictorial examples of what aging and senescence are all about. But we won't dwell too much on that. These are just basic terms that we use to describe the process of aging. The ear consists of three parts. The outer part is the external ear, and it's just that part of the ear that allows us to funnel sound through the canal. And it causes vibration of the eardrum, which then allows three little bones to move that energy, which is mechanical, to a fluid which then allows us to convert it to electricity that goes to the brain. All these structures age as uh, uh, quite normally and as expected, but it's the, it's the inner ear and the structure that looks very much like a helix or a snail, which is where the nerves and the little cells called hair cells start to degenerate age um, accordingly. Usually the higher frequencies are the, are the first to go as we age and we'll find it harder to hear those particular sounds. And then in time and in due course, the lower frequencies also start to weaken and hearing starts to disimprove. Uh, so, so is this in itself uh, a very bad thing? I mean, it's expected. My, my grandmother is old. She's hard of hearing. Uh, that is quite normal. Actually, aging and hearing loss don't necessarily always equate in that sort of way. People can start losing their hearing at the age of 50 or 60, so it's worthwhile if you feel that your hearing is starting to disimprove to have it checked out. Go to a center where you can get a proper hearing test performed and then see an ENT surgeon to decide 
whether or not this particular problem can be remedied, uh, whether or not there is a need for you to actually have a hearing aid or, or the like. So as you age and if you hear, uh, as, as, as you age and if you hear worse, what tends to happen is that there are many ramifications, many other things that go with this hearing loss that perhaps some of you have noticed in your elderly uh, family members, etc. And that is that the, the, there, are, there are certain complaints. Sometimes the patient complains of a buzzing sound in their ear, the, ear, the hearing is muffled, they get ringing. There's a huge amount of frustration and the frustration need not necessarily be on the part of the person who can't hear, but everyone else around them. And this creates a certain amount of isolation. They want to avoid conversation because they're not getting involved. And it also creates a certain amount of inattentiveness and sadly depression as well. One of the things that it can also cause is dementia and I'll go through that uh, later on. Now, hearing aids are often attributed to people with hearing loss and often seen more commonly in people with, uh, with uh, age-related hearing loss. There are different types of hearing aids and the vast majority of them help in um, mild mod to moderate uh, hearing loss. But when you get to a stage where the hearing starts to become severe or profound, many of these hearing aids don't actually help very much. Cochlear implants uh, were used often in, in, uh, in children and, and in babies who were born uh, with sensory neural hearing loss. They just could not hear either at birth or as they developed uh, in their infancy. And so these were, these were designed to try and restore, uh, or, uh, restore hearing, uh, certainly in children who uh, had, had not started to speak yet. And then of course in children who developed diseases after they'd learned to speak and lost their hearing or in adults in the same situation. Cochlear implants have revolutionized age-related hearing loss too, and it is not uncommon to see uh, more and more older people being uh, brought in for cochlear implants. The vast amount of improvements given to the ski slope-like trace that they get in the high-frequency losses that they have. So cochlear implants are certainly indicated, and it's not unknown for patients who are 80, 90, 95 years old to be implant candidates. So age in itself is not an entire restriction to the possibility of placing implants. This is a study that was performed in Singapore uh, and it was a huge study involving at least about, about 3,000 patients. And effectively, as the title suggests, it's, it's all about hearing loss, but it's about neurocognitive disorders in a nation population. Effectively, what are these neurocognitive disorders? What does that mean? In essence, it means that these patients are having trouble basically understanding things at a neurological level. Their brain is not getting the input through their ears. And this has an impact on their ability to concentrate, their ability to remember, and it has a knock-on effect on the capacity to actually have a decent memory leading to dementia. This graph over here shows the number of ears presented in percentage that had a particular type of emission that is produced by the inner ear that is a function of the health of the inner ear or the cochlea at different frequencies in different age groups. And what you can see over here is that as you look at the different age groups, the level of at above 100, if you look at 60 to 65, there's a drop from 100 onwards at the various frequencies, they drop tremendously. This is, this is entirely due to age. So this is quite a profound uh, graph suggesting that as we get older, our capacity to actually hear these frequencies dwindles significantly. And you can see that in the higher frequencies, it's probably almost zero. So that is where the main loss takes place and in the elderly. And here we have, this is, this is basically what we were looking at. These are autoacoustic emissions, so basically sounds that are produced by the inner ears, outer hair cells. It's a form of health of the cochlea or the inner ear mechanism that allows us to hear. And what we see over here in this graph is that there are different levels of hearing loss, mild, moderate, severe, and profound. And as you get from age 60 to 65 to age above 100, which is basically the category that we're hoping to improve, 
that there's a prof the level of profound hearing loss starts to increase and naturally increases as expected in the highest frequencies. So it's a bit low here and it starts to peak up. And you can also see that the percentage of patients with normal, mild, moderate, severe, and profound hearing loss is such. And this is another interesting uh, study. And these are the results of that previous study, the Singapore Longitudinal Age Study that I was describing to you. And we can look at MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment, and dementia at a baseline. So we have about 2,600 patients over here. And what these what these values are basically suggesting is that you can look at the odds ratio, it's 2.95 times higher if you have a severe hearing loss. And this is indeed very significant. So dementia is a big, big problem and it's associated with hearing loss. Mild cognitive impairment, not very significant, but mild cognitive impairment with dementia is significant. So this is also a very important thing. So the conclusions of this study suggest that an increased prevalence and incidence of impairment in hearing impaired subjects in Singapore. So this is a local study. It's very, very applicable to this audience. And the hearing loss is associated with a higher prevalence of dementia, but not mild cognitive impairment. So dementia as such. So take this seriously. If you want to age gracefully and well beyond the age of 100, Look at your hearing and do the utmost you can to try and preserve it, improve upon it, and if needs be, consider surgery in carefully selected cases. So cog cognitively normal participants have a 2.3% likelihood of developing these sorts of diseases and neurocognitive disease. So if you wonder what NCD is, that's a neurocognitive disease. And it's consistent with other populations in the West as well. So this is not a study that is unique to Singapore. Your ears are also involved in helping you with balance. They are not the only structures that help us with balance. In fact, the most important uh, is really our vision. So if you have very poor vision, the likelihood is that your balance will be impaired. But there are other aspects that imp are important for balance. Weakness of your muscles, of your neck, of your joints, etc. Chronic diseases will also affect your balance and increase the risk of falls. And certain medications can also uh, impact on your capacity to maintain a decent balance. There are also risks in the house, on the home situation. So look at, look at your home, look at all the potential hazards that you have, steps, uh, drops, uh, carpeting that is uneven, uh, poor footwear, and of course, these, these go without saying, tripping, stumbling, a new illness, perhaps affecting the feet, etc. A dizzy spell may be associated with the ears, possibly, but also with uh, blood pressure problems, uh, issues associated with uh, the, the eyes, etc. So all these things can be a trigger and that can lead to a fall. So you can live up to 100 or beyond, but if you fall and you fracture your hip, that is one of the one of the more major causes of hospitalization leading to pneumonia and possibly death. So therefore, it's very important to have a very a good focus on how you can improve your balance as you age. So this, this uh, pictorial uh, diagram over here suggests that if you have reduced mobility, you will lose your capacity for, activi uh, for activities of daily living. That's a disability and balance and leads to falls, etc. So frailty is a part of aging, sadly, and frailty leads to these problems. So while you age, it's important to also age and preserve your muscle tone and remain as strong as possible. I won't go into dietary aspects of this. It's not part of the EMT talk. So there are, this is from a textbook, Geriatric Otolaryngology, that was published by the American Academy. And, um, and effectively, it tell, tells us about the various aspects that go into age-related uh, issues with balance. So you've got vestibular loss. Vestibular loss is talking about the loss of the capacity of the balance organ in the ear uh, due to aging and senescence, etc. And then this is age-related stasis, so age-related imbalance and disequilibrium or poor balance. Often it's due to weakness, peripheral sensory issues, and even arthritis, which is very common as we age. 
and finally vertigo. There are many aspects of vertigo, which means spinning, and these are vestibular, neurological, psychological, cardiovascular, etc. So the most common causes of dizziness that are seen by general practitioners include vestibular disease, that has got to do with the ear, Benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is a condition that we see commonly in ENT, and that is when a patient lies down and turns their head to the left or to the right. They get a very short blast of spinning or rotation or vertigo, which settles quite quickly, and then they just get better. It's not associated with nausea or headaches or anything, and it is very self-limiting, often when they're lying down. And this labyrinthitis is inflammation of the inner ear and, and the nerve or balance, which is vestibular neuronitis. And there are other causes like cardiovascular disease, infection, psychiatric conditions, depression being one of them, metabolic conditions, endocrine conditions such as bad glucose balance, or, uh, uh, et cetera, diabetes, and of course, medication. So the path to better balance, well, as you age, hopefully you will continue to exercise, improve or optimize the quality of your joints. Or, and as you do these exercises, you are also exercising your inner ear, the organs that allow you to uh, work out with where your head is, uh, whether you're tilting it, whether you're spinning it around, etc. All these things matter. So it's important as you, as you get to 100, 110, whatever it is that you're going for, Continue to exercise. It doesn't have to be vigorous. It can be gentle, but you're basically trying your best to optimize all the various sensory organs and the muscles that allow you to hold your frame up. So the path to better balance. Make your home safe. Get connected. Find a community-based program that's very useful. Be in touch with your doctor, your ENT doctor, or whoever it may be, cardiologist, ophthalmologist, orthopedic surgeon, the, the lot. Move on to smell and taste. As we age, like everything else, we say, well, things are going to weaken. Smell and taste are no different. Many people above the age of 70 and 80 have lost about 70 to 80 percent of their capacity to smell acutely, and therefore that affects our ability to taste. It is the ability of the molecules that give certain uh, certain foods and drinks, etc., their, their, their smell, that allows us to then combine it with five or six basic tastes to give us flavor. So if you don't smell well, we don't taste well because we lose flavor. We can, we can mention a salty taste or a bitter taste or a, a sour taste, but really the combination of the smell gives us what we call flavor. So as we age, these nerve Fibers, they're found at this point of our, uh, at the top of our nose, where our nose meets our brain. This is the separation between the brain and the nose. And these very, very fine fibers allow us to pick up these molecules. And they recognize these molecules, go via the nerve of smell, and tell us exactly what it is. And it goes to various parts of our brain, uh, which will include the capacity for us to produce saliva, maybe even emotions, etc. So the, the, all, all, these, all these aspects are centered around here. So as we age, our nose ages, the lining of the nose starts to thin. We produce more watery mucus. And uh, our nerves start to die. They, they, are, they, they, they are not replaced. And the, likewise with the taste buds. The taste buds, which allow us to, to taste... Uh, they, they, they are not replaced and they die off too. So this is a problem and it's a difficult problem to solve uh, medically or surgically. Perhaps in the future we may have some stem cell research or what, what have you that may be able to replenish the loss of these uh, taste buds and uh, nerves of smell. So the sense of smell in the US in adults over the age of 40 as we age, you can see that 4% of people between the age of 40 to 49 have a problem with their sense of smell. But once you get to about 80 plus, the figure over here is 39%, but I suspect that this is rather understated. We'll probably have a lot more. Okay. We've also got the taste buds, as I mentioned to you before. And so there are also other aspects, such as drugs that, are, that affect the nose and the lining of the nose. The list is quite com comprehensive and I won't go through it. Your voice and swallow is also affected as you, as you 
muscles of swallow become weaker. You find it harder to swallow. You produce less saliva. It's thicker, your saliva. It has less water in it, and it's harder for you to get things down. And the other thing that, mass, that, that uh, happens is that your, your speech becomes weak, weaker and less understandable. This is the mechanism, mechanism of swallowing that is normal. You, you put your food in your mouth, it gets to the palate, and it's forced down by your tongue, and then, and then it goes into your esophagus. And with voice, just like the weakening of the muscles of swallow, there's a weakening of the muscles of voicing. What you have over here is the voice box of an elderly patient, and you can see that it's kind of bowed. It's lost a lot of its substance. It should be straight. It should be straight, but it's bowed. So it's lost of the substance. The muscle has started to atrophy or weaken, and the voice becomes very weak and croaky. This is a healthier uh, voice box. You can see that they're nice and straight. And this is the voice box of a patient that was about 75 or 80, continued to sing in a choir. And we basically gave them a, like a facelift. We gave them a voice lift. We injected some substance inside the voice box, which is a biodegradable substance. And that sort of filled up the voice box and they got much better. They could sing in the choir yet again. These are various pictures of how we assess swallow in the elderly. And what we do is we give them different types of colored food to see whether or not the food actually goes inside the voice box and penetrates or aspirates into the lung. Of course, that is a bad sign because that increases the likelihood of pneumonia, which is a disease that affects the lung. And so what we want to do as we age is that we want to make sure that we have the capacity to prevent food from actually entering our lungs and causing aspiration, which, is, which leads to pneumonia and, what, and is one of the major sources of death. So there are various types of people to help with swallowing exercises. And there are conditions that people develop as they age, such as Parkinson's. And these patients suffer from swallowing disorders, which we try our very best to help with. Finally, we go through sleep. Sleep, el the elderly tend to wake up in the middle of, of the night, either trying to use the toilet, etc. But they also cat nap and they don't sleep for very many hours. So sleep hygiene and the capacity to sleep, snore, stop breathing, these are aspects that you want to have a look at if it's bothering you, or certainly is bothering you when you're 70. Uh, it would be worthwhile having this looked at uh, by an ENT surgeon or a sleep physiologist or respiratory physician. So what are the options? Very briefly, treat the underlying pathology, optimize the senses, institute early treatment, establish the issues concerning safety, be they environmental, look at falls. So the sense of smell makes us able to pick out fires, and food spoilage. So the sense of smell is very important for our own protection. Hearing allows us to work out which way, which direction the traffic is going. So if you don't hear very well, you won't know whether a bus is moving from left or right, or right to left. Aspiration risks, depression, and other neurodegenerative diseases. So in, in conclusion, save your senses as you age. Hearing, smell, touch, sight, and taste, they're all very important, and they matter in living up to 100 and beyond in an elegant and happy manner. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you for the wonderful presentation over there. So I think there's more and more questions building up in the Q&A, so we'll take them all at the end. So coming up, last but not least, we have Dr. Daphne Han. She's a senior consultant, so experienced eye specialist and eye surgeon for more than 18 years in specialty practice, trained and work in Australia, England, and Singapore, manages all eye-related conditions in the young and old, including lens and cataract, cornea, myopia, etc. So I think without much further ado, may I invite Dr. Daphne uh, on stage and then share with us. While Dr. Daphne is preparing, so you can all put your question into the Q&A. I think today is quite a heavy topic from the heart, ENT to the eye. Well, I see a lot of thank you, Susie, to all panelists. Thank, thank you, Dr. What? That's a question over there. May I know... Okay, the, the, the speaker just presented to you is, was Dr. Prasad. So we'll share all their contact number, including the website of their prestigious oh, clinic to each and every one of you. Okay, let me help you with this, Stephanie. Give me one minute. Okay, 
can put this up. Hi, uh, oh. we're just setting up. Yep, you're on center stage now. Yep, uh, I've got some slides as well. So hi, um, everyone, I'm uh, the eye doctor. And uh, I'm going to talk about how to prevent eye deterioration since, you know, the aim today is to try and join the Centenarian Club. Well, when you're 100 years old, hopefully your eyes will still be good enough for you to walk around and do the things that you like to do. And um, so, okay, um, how does our vision uh, affect our life? Uh, there are actually many studies uh, looking at that. And uh, one of the most, uh, well, a large scale study was performed in Australia in um, well, the mountainous area called the Blue Mountains. Since now we're all, the, um, you know, well, not able to travel. Uh, let me bring you to, uh, you know, all these places by uh, their researchers for a little bit of traveling, <laughs> virtual, virtual traveling. And so, okay, in Blue Mountain, um, it, the researchers there did a longitudinal study. They looked at their population with eye diseases over a period of about uh, close to 15 years. And they found that, you know, um, poor eyesight or vision impairment is indeed associated with an increased risk of all cause mortality. So, you know, they um, standardized it. They look at, you know, distribution of sex and age, and they also look at uh, various other factors, uh, you know, such as smoking, uh, you know, other diseases that may be affected, uh, or affecting the, you know, uh, well, about thousand odd people. So they studied more than 3000 people, out of whom uh, more than a thousand were included in this uh, particular section. And uh, basically, the conclusion is that um, visual impairment can, well, uh, increase your mortality. That means your, you know, death. Yeah. And uh, an indirect link uh, between poor vision and death is walking, the uh, disability or inability to walk. So um, it's actually quite uh, natural for us to all want to be able to see things in so much of our life and our lifestyle nowadays are dependent on our vision. Um, you know, you know, a lot of times we are, you know, well, you know, uh, using our social media, posting, receiving a lot of information through that and all that is through our vision. So um, not only does our vision affect our enjoyment of life, uh, it, you know, uh, well, it can also, your know, loss of uh, the vision can also cause uh, psychiatric problems. So uh, a couple of studies as well, looking at uh, vision and depression and even suicide. So in Korea, uh, you know, they looked at the uh, well, uh, rate of uh, depression in uh, the people who are uh, blind, and there's a 15 to 31 percent increase uh, in the hazard of uh, uh, death uh, and of depression in the visually uh, impaired. And then in Finland, they also did another study looking at the hazard of suicide in, uh, in blind people, and in particular, it was found that this is significantly increased in males. Uh, maybe it's got to do with the testosterone <laughs> uh, or, you know, just being uh, a little bit more prone to uh, violent means of, uh, you know, uh, committing suicide and, um, you know, particularly in aging males. So, okay. Um, our eye is actually one of the smallest organs in our body. Uh, from front to back, it measures just 23 on average, 23 millimeter. And uh, within this 23 millimeter globe, uh, there are actually, well, many different structures and layers from front to back. Um, and, you know, many of the eye doctors specialize in just one little section of the eye. And, um, you know, um, I look at the whole eye um, as a whole because, you know, well, each layer of the eye work uh, in tandem with the others. And uh, we know that the sense of sight actually contributes to the vast majority of our impression of the world. And, um, you know, in Singapore, uh, there are a couple of uh, very common eye diseases. I know uh, most of you are probably, you know, going to say, oh, myopia, you know, affects uh, the young, the old. Yep. But since we're talking about 
trying to live to 100 years old, uh, the more common diseases that we want to be, uh, you know, focusing on are cataracts. Uh, you know, in Chinese, sometimes we just call it uh, nei zhang or sen mo. Uh, you know, a lot of the um, elderly just call it sen mo. Yeah, cataract. Glaucoma. Glaucoma is uh, also pretty prevalent in Singapore. About 3% of our population have that. And these two diseases are uh, related to the front part of the eye. And then there are the other uh, more common back of the eye diseases, diabetic retinopathy associated with diabetes and age-related macular degeneration. And of course, you know, refractive errors, uh, which means eye power issues, um, such as short sight, long sight, and uh, presbyopia, uh, that is very, very common but uh, this is what affects almost everybody and not just the elderly. So firstly, I just want to talk about cataract because this is the number one most common problem as we age. And uh, as we get older, the lens within the eye loses its transparency. So if you're planning to live to a hundred year old, uh, you know, you're gonna to have to you know, uh, take care of your lens that will gradually become a cataract at the point of about 60 year old. So in our local studies, 80% of those who are 60 year old and above have cataracts, uh, cataracts, significant cataracts that is affecting their vision already. So as the lens loses its transparency, uh, partly through UV exposure, partly through just aging the lens uh, fibers, become harder and you know, more squashed together. And uh, also diseases, particularly metabolic diseases such as diabetes, medications use, steroid, uh, injury, and also smoking. As it loses its transparency, uh, people will start to get symptoms of cataract, which will be fluctuating vision and also fluctuating eye power sometimes. Um, blurred vision, dimmer vision, you know, uh, glare. So things seem to be extra bright. And uh, night vision may be uh, well, worsening. And that's, you know, got reduced contrast, uh, reduced color perception as well, may be uh, experienced. And reduced color perception can sometimes lead to um, psychiatric problems, you know, uh, depression, feeling pretty sad. And, uh, you know, that is uh, something that I have already spoken about earlier. So this is a picture here to show the hardened and opacified lens, which is you know, a cataract. And uh, one of the pictures that I like to show is this of the paintings of this famous uh, impressionist painter from uh, France. And um, you know, Monet is very famous for painting water lilies and you know, this beautiful garden um, with lots of flowers and um, as he aged, it was uh, actually noted, you know, historically that his painting style uh, and colors that he used became uh, gradually more brown and yellow. And, um, you know, this was really actually caused by his uh, growing cataracts. And even back in the 1920s, cataract surgeries were done. And at one point after the surgeries uh, were done for his cataracts, his uh, painting, uh, well, his color palette actually changed. And so this was, uh, you know, uh, uh, was something that is recorded quite nicely in some of the textbooks on artists and their um, eye diseases, actually. So how do we detect a cataract? Uh, to find out whether you have a cataract or not, um, we do a slit lamp examination, which is what all eye doctors have in the eye clinic. And through that, we can uh, you know, see the cataract and try to grade them depending on their color and uh, you know, uh, basically hardness of the cataract. And uh, based on that, we can, you know, together with the patient, decide whether or not uh, something needs to be done if it is in the early stage, perhaps just, you know, uh, eye protection, you know, preventing too much UV uh, light. So uh, you've heard, you know, Donald Trump has talked about UV light to kill the virus, but no, try not to do that uh, for your eyes because that's going to make the cataracts you know, grow faster. And up to a point when the cataracts are clouding your vision uh, and, uh, you know, affecting your daily activities, uh, it may be time to consider 
a uh, treatment in the way of a surgery, which is nowadays very, very successful with you know, uh, lots of advancement in technology. So at the point uh, of wanting to consider treatment with the lens surgery, we would do a biometry, which is a measurement of the internal dimensions of the eye. And sometimes we do that even in early stages of cataract to monitor it and to look at uh, whether or not the cataract is affecting other parts of the eye or causing other problems such as potentially even uh, irreversible damage uh, in the form of glaucoma and other, yet another eye disease. This is a scan that I get from using uh, the biometry. So in our clinic, we have this lovely Swiss made Galilei G6, which measures the front as well as the entire length of the eyeball. So, you know, basically kills many birds with one stone. I get, I get a very full picture of the eye with this scan, including assessment of glaucoma risk. So, um, I was uh, you know, fortunate to be invited to participate in a study run by Johnson & Johnson a couple of years ago, looking at the um, you know, reaction and response of our local um, elderly to cataract and cataract surgery. So in that um, you know, uh, study, we found that many of the Singaporean uh, elderly are quite apprehensive and anxious about undergoing cataract surgery. There are quite a lot of misconceptions um, you know, about surgery, uh, and even when it is a simple day surgery, such as a cataract surgery. So the cataract surgery success rate is nowadays very high, and it's one of the commonest uh, surgeries done in the world. Right now, we don't do it uh, thanks to COVID circuit breaker uh, measures, um, but you know, uh, unless it's a very urgent case. But um, in general, it is a surgery that lasts just 30 minutes and um, it is, you know, day case, you go home the same day. And we use a touch of laser when the cataract is very dense to help to improve our success rate and to reduce possible damage to the surrounding tissue. And by and large, just with a little bit of uh, ultrasound um, energy, we remove the cataract and uh, put in a lens implant. So much so that nowadays I even have much younger patients coming in requesting for the cataract surgery, uh, even before they reach 50 year old. So how does the cataract surgery actually affect our life? Again, cataract is one of the big topics in um, eye research. Uh, when it comes to uh, lifespan, mortality, and quality of life issues. And uh, there's so many studies, but um, you know, in general, we just look at the few more uh, you know, dominant and important ones. And again, this Blue Mountain study, the 3,000 odd patients, you know, uh, and then we talk about you know, uh, this one here, particularly this section, just 300 odd participants. And basically, again, you know, compared a lot of things, you know, not just, um, you know, uh, uh, well, uh, well, it's this, uh, you know, uh, sex and age, you know, we looked at uh, various things, you know, associations with uh, body mass index, you know, uh, qualifications, even uh, self uh, rated health, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Basically, um, if we're cutting the long story short, there's a 40 to 46% reduction of hazard of death in this particular group of patients, 300 odd, you know, from Australia following uh, surgical reduction for cataract. So yeah, good news, simple surgery, half an hour, and you can reduce your hazard of death by 40 to 46%. And, um, you know, uh, as I said earlier, you know, the uh, other studies were looking at the intermediary. So, you know, the disability of walking as an indirect marker and uh, true enough, cataract surgery does lead to a reduction of fall in this Canadian study here. And so these are the things that we look at as evidence-based uh, medicine. All right. So um, just a uh, you know, couple more pictures on cataract. So as you can see, this picture here is a very white cataract. And this is actually one of my patients who uh, was so fearful of cataract surgery. And uh, he was living with cataracts in both eyes, which were getting denser and denser and we were following him up uh, you know, every couple of months to the point when his eyesight was so poor that he was at risk of falling over. And uh, you know, it took a long time for us to persuade him to you know, have the surgery somehow. And eventually we did it and we did it with the laser. And uh, it was uh, lovely. It was uh, you know, quick, uh, half an hour. 
despite the density of the cataract. And uh, oh, let me just bring the yeah, yeah. So this is just a little video showing the um, cataract surgery being done by the laser method, which is much gentler. And uh, then, you know, some of the older techniques such as the large wound um, extracapsular cataract surgery, which is still being done sometimes in Singapore, very rarely. But you can see the laser cuts, uh, which basically is by using uh, tiny little air bubbles. You can see the, you know, uh, ultrasound being used now, little bubbles, to be, uh, you know, basically joining up to become the big bubbles. And uh, that's how we suck it up. Okay, so I have a few more slides regarding the other, um, you know, common uh, problems in the elderly. So um, maybe I'll just run through uh, three more slides. So glaucoma, the thief of sight. This is a condition that affects about 3% of our population, something that is related to our genes and something that is symptomless. Yeah, that's glaucoma and for which eye screening is very important. And if it is not detected early enough, the uh, visual field of the person, that means the area that you can see, becomes shrunken over time. And at the end of which, you know, it becomes a tunnel vision. So detection again is through clinical examination and imaging. Most of it is very non-invasive. And of course, you know, it's uh, earlier rather than uh, later. Uh, if you detect it earlier, you can treat it. And then basically we have uh, two different classification, open and closed angle. The treatment is somewhat different, but whichever type of glaucoma you have, uh, the gist is that earlier screening, earlier detection, uh, basically will save the day. And uh, if it is, you know, uh, detected and treated late, uh, sight may be lost to the extent that navigation becomes a problem. Uh, patients will find it, you know, harder to see and to, to live, uh, and to walk around, and it does affect your lifespan. And, uh, you know, some uh, research has also found that, you know, advanced glaucoma uh, can be a problem and affect our mortality. So the third most common um, eye problem in Singapore in the elderly is age-related macular degeneration. This is a condition that can affect our central vision and it is related to our circulation. So poor heart health we, uh, also affects the eye in this way. And uh, you know, uh, genes also, of course does play a part too. And treatment, again, same story as glaucoma and cataract early screening. If we find it early, we can treat um, either through prevention, you know, uh, dietary therapy seems to be slightly effective. It's not going to cure the problem, but it may reduce the severity. So we often uh, try and prescribe some supplement such as this one, uh, called preservation, it's basically a combination of vitamin A, C, E, zinc, lutein and zeaxanthin. Uh, these are pigments which are found in dark colored vegetables and fruits such as blueberries, papayas, you know, and so this one uh, easily available. And uh, of course, the treatment, uh, if there's any significant problems, then it becomes quite medical. We sometimes use injections which are uh, sequential, need to be done every month or so for a period of time. And uh, surgery is rarely needed for the age-related macular degeneration. And uh, you know, uh, what's interesting about these diseases affecting the back of the eye uh, related to the uh, blood vessels of the eye is that they often also reflect on our uh, lifespan. So the you know, more severe your um, blood vessel diseases are in the eye, uh, means that you know perhaps you know uh, the circulatory system is poor, metabolic problems like diabetes may also be very severe, and uh, that affects your lifespan. So last but not least, talking about diabetic retinopathy, uh, it's something that affects all diabetic people. Um, you know, uh, after five to ten years, all of them will have some form of diabetic retinopathy. So it is important to screen for it in a severe stage. You know, eyesight can be badly affected by bleeding in the eye or swelling at the macular area, which is the center part of the retina. And again, regular eye screening and uh, you know, tight control of the diabetes is highly important. 
uh, when it's in the advanced stage, then you know, treatment will be again through laser and injectables. And last but not least, uh, just to touch on you know, what I've already talked about, myopia, hypropia, all these are eye power problems. These can sometimes affect your quality of life in that you know, you're restricted in your sports or even your uh, you know, uh, job uh, uh, vocation. And uh, you know, uh, we do do a pretty good job treating this nowadays. The technology is there with lasers and lenses. And uh, not long ago, we have started our own LASIK clinic at uh, Singapore Medical Specialty Center and uh, MWH. And this is in Paragon right now. Uh, we don't do cases for co um, due to COVID reasons currently, but we are hoping to restart again soon. And these are elective treatment that is quick, uh, you know, generally painless and highly effective in improving our quality of life so that we can all walk more, exercise more, you know, see properly what we eat, <laughs> what are the health choices that we have uh, in general, and hopefully all get to live to 100 year old. All right, yeah, that's my last slide. Thank you. So, um, thank you, thank you, Dr. Daphne, for a very insightful session. There's a lot of questions now. Uh, anyway, I saw a slide whereby you flash on the magic number 40 years old, and then our eyesight will start to experience some deterioration. In fact, I think I witnessed it percent. Ever since <laughs> this year, something yeah. overnight magically happened is that my eyesight start to become a little bit blurry. I know, I know. Sometimes it takes people by surprise. And uh, I do have a you know, fair number of patients who walk in thinking that really bad things had happened to their eyes when actually it is the 40-year-old bell ringing. <laughs> and that's when you get your lao hua yen, uh, your presbyopia. But it's good to you know, use that as a reminder to have a general eye check. And then from then on, we can see what are the possible telltale signs of other parts of the body. And sometimes I do detect such as you know, problems such as uh, you know, glaucoma, which can uh, occasionally indicate underlying possible sleep apnea, snoring problems. And then I will talk to Dr. Vias. And sometimes I may detect age-related macular degeneration or some, you know, very, very uh, beginning stage of that, which also may uh, indicate, you know, circulatory system problems, high blood pressure, you know, possible, uh, you know, heart tracing problems, and then there will be, you know, uh, cardiac EG screening. So, yeah, it's um, all tied up. Thank you for the sharing. So I have this question that was repeated a couple of times, so I think that we, we can help to address. So they're asking that after cataract treatment, will we still have vision loss? Um, the idea is not to have vision loss. The idea is to basically repair it and you know reverse your vision loss from cataract to the point that you can see much better than before the cataract surgery. And oftentimes, uh, with the current technology, not only do we not have any collateral damage, we can choose a nice lens implant that can reverse the sight so much so that the person is seeing like they're 21 year old. Um, I, you know, uh, had the experience of operating on a um, very successful uh, Arabian, uh, you know, gentleman, uh, well, not too long ago. And he was in his 70s, cataract, you know, kosher cataract, yeah, a real proper cataract. And uh, after having the cataract surgery, he was seeing very well, far, mid distance, and near, with the choice of a uh, rather a uh, premium lens implant. And his son, who is in the 50s, early 50s, not yet diagnosed with the cataract was at that stage having some difficulty with reading. So after his father's cataract surgery, he was rather envious <laughs> of the old man's visual acuity. Yeah. So yes, yeah. Well, if with proper selection of the technique as well as implant uh, with the cataract surgery, you know, yeah, that shouldn't be a worry. Thank you, thank okay. you. Actually, you answered two questions at one time, means okay. is there any Lovely. law after the surgery? And also you answered about which type of surgery to, to choose from. So the, the, the question leading on is from here. They're asking, is there any age limit whereby they should do their cataract surgery by or maybe past a certain age is actually not much of a difference? 
Um, okay, if I were to tell you the age range of my cataract patients, perhaps that could partly answer that. So the youngest cataract surgery patient I had was, in fact, in the teens. In the teens, he was a relief, well, a, a, a delivery rider. That was a couple of years ago. Uh, who unfortunately had asthma as a teenager, and you know uh, when he was younger as well. So for the asthma, he took a lot of steroid medications, which caused the cataract to uh, grow. And steroid medications. Uh, uh, sometimes given for various diseases, not just in the elderly. Yeah? So it, for skin problems as well. So 16-year-old and he had to undergo a cataract surgery. So that's the earlier, the younger age group. How about the older age group? The oldest patient I had operated on for cataracts was um, a centenarian. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yes. So there you go. And the worry about operating on a very advanced cataract in a very old patient is that the cataract can be so rock hard that while we're doing the cataract surgery, we may damage other tissues, other part of the eye. So within that 20 odd millimeter, the front part, which is the cornea, uh, well, may be affected if there is a very high energy used in the ultrasound. But with the laser, uh, you know, touch, uh, we can reduce the ultrasound and therefore uh, preserve the cells of the cornea that way. So yeah, um, technology keeps advancing as Dr. Lim said, um, in including in ophthalmology, you know, um, yeah, it's uh, not impossible at all with the current status. Thank you, thank you Dr. Daphne for sharing that. So maybe to end off with this uh, question about the eye, how long or maybe what's the interval that you recommend for people to go have an eye checkup? Well, if um, it's just a routine screening above 50 year old, definitely we you know recommend once a year. Between 40 to 50, if there's no significant family history such as of glaucoma, uh, you know, no other risk factors such as you know, very significant uh, you know, uh, diabetes uh, and heart diseases maybe once every 18 months to two years. And uh, yeah, so basically it's between that. Yeah. Annual checkup past 50 year old is highly recommended. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think there's also a fallacy out there where people think that they go to an optician to get an eye checkup, they are safe. Actually, from your sharing today, we learned that there's much more to the health of the eye rather than just vision loss. In fact, we just want to, from your sharing, I learned something as well is that what was the root cause of it? And then how can we do the preventive measure rather than just going to an optician to, to fix the eye defect or something like that? Thank you. Thank you for the session today. So thank you for answering the question. After. We're going to move on to Dr. Bias Prasad. Give me a minute while I put you on spotlight. Doctor, before we start, I need your help with something very important. Can you share with me how to pronounce your name accurately? Because I've been I've been trying to, to to overcome it. Oh, you aren't doing badly. It's Vyas. 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 Vyas Prasad. Vyas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We would like to get that correct. There's a lot of question for you, doctor. I think your session triggers a lot of things. So I let me share this. Okay. Question number one. You mentioned. Um, let me see. Okay. What is the cause of the spinning effect of the head on the left or, or the right? What's the root cause of it? Asked by Jane inside the participant. Okay, so the root cause of it is the fact that we have certain particles that are found in the inner ear. The inner ear is fairly complex, but consider it as certain particles that resemble grains of sand. They're, they're basically a, a form of calcium carbonate crystals. And what happens is that they usually lie within the structures in the inner ear that have a type of jelly. And this jelly keeps them happily in their rightful place. But what tends to happen in benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is that these sand grain-like crystals dislodge from the jelly and they, and, they, and they fall, usually due to a gravitational effect, into one of the semicircular canals. And when they do, what, what happens is that the physical effect of this movement causes the fluid in the inner ear in these canals to move. And that rotational movement 
gives you this feeling of spinning. That's, that's basically what happens. What causes it? Well, multiple things. Sometimes we don't know. Sometimes it's trauma. You, have, you can have a, a sort of a hit to the head or a concussion to the head. Sometimes it's an infection of the inner ear. So you can have a very bad infection of the inner ear, which causes inflammation of the inner ear, and then you get over it. That, that particular infection can cause spinning as well. It's very bad, much worse than this particular condition. And then you get over it after a couple of weeks. And then months later, you develop this spinning when you turn your head to the left or right. So it's a consequence of the original infection. So that's, that's basically what it is. Thank you, doctor, for the very detailed answer. So they, they would like to also understand sleep apnea. Can it be cured or managed? Okay, let's, so say if, let, let's say that if they ignore it, what are the long-term effects? Is it going to lead to something disastrous? It could. Uh, sleep apnea certainly can lead to uh, disaster. I can't say it, 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 it's impossible. But there are many patients with sleep apnea, and it really depends on whether or not those patients have mild, moderate, or severe sleep apnea, and whether or not their symptoms uh, are also associated with other signs. So, for instance, if a particular patient has issues with choking, uh, gasping, uh, falling asleep at the wheel, etc., I mean, all these, all these situations can be quite hazardous. It can affect your heart. It can lead to se severe heart strain. It can affect the lungs and leads to severe strain and raised pressure in the lungs. Uh, so that can eventually lead to heart failure or heart attack, etc. So uh, that's certainly uh, been described. I think if you have moderate to severe sleep apnea and you haven't seen anyone about it and had it A, diagnosed and B, managed, then uh, you could be going down the path of a disaster. Of course, uh, add to that obesity and other uh, comorbidities, and then you, you're a ticking time bomb. But sleep apnea also affects your capacity to remember. You have issues with your memory. Uh, whether or not that hastens dementia is debatable, but, and I don't, I don't believe that there's very much of an analysis associating one with the other. But yes, sleep apnea comes in various shades. So uh, if you're very mild and you can do something about it, with just basic weight loss, etc., then that's fine. Have your nose looked at, have your mouth looked at, have your throat looked at, your jaw looked at. It's important to first recognize, hey, I've got a problem. I, I, you know, I, I don't sleep very well. I think I sleep very well, but my spouse or my family says that this is not the case. And then get yourself checked out. Sleep apnea can be very, very dangerous. And in some patients, it can kill. Not everyone, but it's certainly something that I would take very seriously. Thank you very much, doctor. I think that's a great piece of advice that we should not take things uh, too lightly, that anything that our body is trying to tell us is a symptom of something that we should actually go and get a checkout from, for, for that. So uh, moving on, I think this is something that we, everybody might have experienced once in a while or ex at least experienced once before, the ringing of the ears. I mean, what causes it? What causes it? Is it more common when we age or is there an underlying reason for it? Okay, so the ringing of the ears, uh, or tinnitus as we describe it in the medical parlance, is a very complex uh, symptom. Uh, and it's a symptom which uh, almost invariably is only described by the sufferer. So if I say I've got ringing in my ears, uh, you either believe me or you don't. That's the end of it. So that's the first thing. To prove that I actually have it is virtually impossible. That's the first thing. The next thing is that it, it occurs in a very wide variety of instances. It can occur because you haven't had your lunch and you're a bit hypoglycemic. It can be because you're very anxious, you're disturbed, you're, you're depressed, you're sad. So your emotions have an effect as well, and that can cause tinnitus. Hearing loss is a very, very common uh, reason for tinnitus. But tinnitus can also be due to things which are far more uh, rarer, but far, far more serious. It can be due to a tumor of the nerve of balance and hearing, uh, and it can be the first symptom that presents. So if someone has tinnitus and that tinnitus is unchecked and it goes on in one year more so than the other, and classically that is a symptom that we take seriously, you should really see uh, an ENT surgeon and have yourself checked out, have a hearing test, and then consider having an MRI scan or whatever it may be that your specialist deems as being necessary. So 
Tinnitus as a symptom is a difficult symptom to pinpoint. Having it doesn't necessarily mean you must have a hearing loss. It doesn't mean that you must have a tumor. But it is a manifestation of some element of, of uh, anomaly. And we, we, uh, we would suggest that the first port of call should be an ENT surgeon if you have tinnitus. Thank you, doctor, for, for your answer. So I think that's, that's a great, uh, you summarized quite a few of the questions together. So is there any tips for everyone to take care of their ENT or something that we do in our daily wise or how eat healthily? Sorry, you broke off a little bit. Or maybe what kind of food can we eat so that we can help preserve our, our hearing and get better taste? Oh, yeah, there was a question. In the loss of taste, can it ever be recovered? Yes, it can. Uh, it's a question of what the cause of the loss of taste may be. So if the cause of the loss of taste is a, is a, is a complete loss of your taste buds, well, then the answer to that question is unless we have the capacity to regenerate taste buds, which at this point in time we don't, then yes, sadly, it is a permanent loss. But let us say that the loss of taste is associated with Drugs. Drugs are very commonly uh, uh, taken. We, we take all sorts of things from mouthwashes to uh, blood pressure tablets, etc. Some of these drugs actually have an effect on the, on the uh, ability for us to taste. Infections uh, uh, can affect the uh, sense of taste uh, and the quality of taste. Dehydration, you need saliva. Without saliva, you can't mix the food particles around so that your taste buds can actually get to them. So all these, all these features and factors that are associated with taste need to be looked at. And if you happen to have someone who is not 100, 110, but someone who is 25 or 30, and they say, look, you know, I can't taste very well, then of course that requires a complete comprehensive examination of uh, the, uh, particularly the nose and throat. But you'd be surprised because the nerves that subserve the capacity to taste from the front two-thirds or so of the tongue, actually comes through the ear. So it would be worthwhile, if you happen to have a problem with your taste, to see an ENT surgeon. And an ENT surgeon would examine your ear as well. So if you say, well, why are you looking at my ear? You know, why aren't you just looking at my mouth? Well, your ear is where this nerve actually comes through. So it's worthwhile making sure you don't have ear pathology. And of course, taste has got to do so much with the nose, as I mentioned earlier. So if you happen to have nasal polyps, let's say you have a very blocked nose, let's say you happen to have a swollen uh, lining of the nose or what we call the turbinates, which are these structures that uh, stick out from the sidewall of your nose and they're swollen. So you can't actually get the particles that give you smell up to those nerves I was describing before. Well, you've got a problem. You need to fix your nose and maybe that'll fix your taste. So whoever uh, you see, which ENT surgeon or whatever, is likely to examine you carefully and look at all the potential sources of problem and then decide which is, which is the most likely source of the problem or sources and then deal accordingly. But yes, coming back to that question again, if you're 110 and you've lost uh, your taste buds and everything else seems to be normal, well, it's really stem cell research and all these other things uh, further down the line that I hope will be able to give us the capacity to smell taste better. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. From your sharing, there's only one thing I'm very, very sure. If, that we, if there's anything with my ENT, you are the band I'm going to go to. Definitely. You give me so much confidence and then you assure me is that everything is systematic, step by step, and then you will do your best to find out what the top root cause of the problem is. Thank you very much for your sharing today. So You're very welcome. We're going to move on to Dr. Michael Lim. There's whereby the power of the question is for you. I think from last week's um, sharing, there's been overpouring of questions coming to our company okay. asking for more sharing by you. So I think about the heart is something that everybody's very, very concerned about and is something very important. Of course, ENT, eyes are all very important function as well. Uh, one of the questions, because that's now you mentioned about LDL. So they are thinking... Uh, we sh should we just monitor the LDL or we need to monitor the whole cholesterol level? Okay, so uh, so I uh, just quickly mentioned a bit about HDL. So in the past, people say HDL is good cholesterol. 
But about more than 10 years ago, there were four big studies where they increased the HDL by more than 100% using uh, medication and no benefit. So more than 10 years ago, this concept was considered as obsolete. So we don't talk about any supplements or any drugs that increase the HDL, really not of much use. So the focus now is on what we call the LDL cholesterol. So LDL cholesterol, uh, just now I showed you, if you look very carefully at the fine print, there are seven subtypes. So then we realize that, hey, it's not all the same. I've seen patients, for example, uh, LDL is more than 200. Arteries are perfectly clean. And then the patient asked me, hey, doc, uh, do I need to take medicine? And you know what my answer was? No need. But why did I come to that conclusion? Because I further analyzed the situation and realized that his cholesterol were mainly all large particles. So the large particles, when they go into the artery, they cannot pass through the gaps between the cells, so cannot block his arteries. So you find some people, unfortunately, their cholesterol are mainly what we call small particle cholesterol. So if it's very small, then your cholesterol need not be very high, but if you have a lot of small particles, they can still pass through and block your arteries. So it depends. So every person is different, but definitely I think uh, focusing on the LDL is very important because all the studies show that uh, as, you, as it goes lower, your risk is lower. So just now I showed you one slide, if you pay attention to it, that even after taking the cholesterol tablets called statins, about 60 to 70% still get a heart attack. So what, what, is, what, is, what is the issue? See? So the issue is that not lowered low enough. So if you look at some of the current guidelines, even lower than the past. So the European guidelines say that you should bring the LDL less than 55 uh, or 1.5 millimoles if you have a blocked artery. So the standards. And then I saw in the question, somebody asked about this thing called uh, PCSK9 inhibitor. So this is a new generation of drugs. So what these drugs do is quite simple. Every time our blood with the cholesterol flows through the liver, the liver is very efficient. The liver actually removes the cholesterol. But this cholesterol removing mechanism uh, is limited. So what these drugs do is that they make this mechanism more efficient. So every time the blood goes to cholesterol, uh, uh, the blood goes to the liver, cholesterol is removed. So these injections currently, the ones available market, you need to inject them twice a week, I'm sorry, once in two weeks, sorry. And they're very effective. They can drop your LDL to less than 30. But some good news for all of you, uh, maybe next year, but already approved, uh, there's a new generation of drugs uh, similar to what I just explained just now, where you just need to inject twice a year. That means once in every six months, and then you can enjoy your bakute, chakwe tiao, chicken brani. I'm just joking. Huh? <laughs> you still need to watch your diet. But what is, what is saying is that it's going to be much easier uh, to control your cholesterol uh, with uh, the new generation medicine. So I think people are going to live longer because once you control cholesterol, your plaques are going to be very stable, difficult to tear, and therefore difficult to get a heart attack. So getting to 100 is not really too difficult. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for, for the answer. So I think uh, while following your answer, right, I think this participant is very resourceful. He managed to get my mobile number and send me the question <laughs> directly. So that's okay. how, he, how much you want to know. That's why I think that we should, okay. we should address this question. Mr. Francis, um, he's asking, Dr. Michael, so is it true that the high level of LDL does not necessarily result in more formation of blood? Heard that the new studies show that lack of vitamin C is the root cause of blood formation as the body will use lipoprotein A, naturally produced by the body to repair the blood vessel cracks. Therefore, would maintaining adequate level of vitamin C in the body at all times be able to help at least minimize the formation of blood while LDL level is high? Okay, so, uh, you know, there are a lot of theories about uh, vitamin C or even I saw some questions about omega-3 as well. So I think uh, while there are a lot of very interesting theories, uh, we make decisions based on what the studies show us. That means people have conducted well-designed studies uh, proper uh, studies, and then we look at the data and we ask ourselves the questions. Uh, so, for example, uh, 
there is no doubt that lowering cholesterol makes a difference. So I give you an example, real world example. Uh, patients referred to me. Uh, we did a CT scan of heart arteries. And uh, I told you the CT, the beauty about it is that not only can see the plaque, but we can see whether it's soft or hard. So I told the patient, look, this is your plaque. Look at it, it's soft. Uh, we can treat it. No need to put a stent. And we treated it very aggressively with cholesterol-lowering medication. And about uh, between six months to one year, a couple of patients, we could reduce the blockage from more than 50% to less than 20%. So no need to do stents, no need to do any, and all these require colors. No amount of vitamin C is going to do that. So vitamin C is not going to make a difference. So some people ask, how about fish oil, omega-3? Uh, by the way, not very cheap as well, fish oil, omega-3. So should you invest in omega-3? Should you buy all these supplements and all? So the data, as the facts tell you, number one, omega-3 consumption does not prevent stroke. That's number one it does not prevent heart attack. So you must ask yourself, you are taking that particular supplement, what is your aim when you're taking what, what is it that you want to achieve? So if you are taking omega-3 for the purposes of trying to prevent a heart attack or prevent a stroke, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen based on all the studies. So uh, we do use omega-3 uh, sometimes in a special category of patients where the triglycerides is very, very high in the thousands. So in those patients, if you use omega-3, the triglycerides can be lowered, can be lowered. Um, maybe I might just jump in because I saw some questions about the CT uh, coronary angiogram as well. So, so you must understand that uh, not all scans are the same, not all machines are the same. So for example, some of the GPs have referred patients to me because they had CT coronary angiograms of their arteries done uh, in some centers. And what happened is that they were diagnosed with significant disease. So they did not want to have an invasive test for precisely the reasons I explained to you because the invasive test does carry real risk and you can't really see the plug. You can only see the lumen, all right? So when they came, I mean, we discussed various options and some of them decided that they want to repeat the scan. So what we did is that we used the newest generation scanners and uh, we were able to demonstrate to the patient that, oh, fortunately, uh, and, and what we do is that we show it to the patient so they can visualize, uh, no significant block. So they're all totally relieved, even though the earlier scans had shown significant block. Why is that so? The reason for that is that when you take a picture of the heart, it's not like, oh, please stand still, don't move. The heart is a moving organ, so it's pumping all the time. So the machine must be really good enough to be able to take a freeze frame of the artery so that even when a heart is moving, you get a very clear. It's just like if I take a 1 megapixel and a 20 megapixel camera, so when you move, when I'm trying to take a picture, it might be a bit blurred. So it's difficult for the doctor to estimate. But if I have a very good camera, even with motion, a little bit of motion, I can see very clearly. So they are not all the same. That's number one. Number two, the radiation dose can vary significantly. So, for example, in the newer generation one, I told you, it can go down to as low as one mammogram. And if you take an older generation, that radiation dose can be 30 times, 30 times that. And if you take a PET CT scan, which people do in cancer, that can be 50 times the radiation dose. So, not all are the same. But most importantly, uh, it's not just a radiation dose, and thing, but I think importantly, uh, whichever doctor you want to go to, I think it's useful if the doctor himself is very familiar and is able to go through and show you because then that's where I think, uh, you know, if I can tell you you've got blocked artery, no use. But when I show it to you and I tell a hey, look here, friend, you've got blocked, then I guarantee you, you'll change your lifestyle and your diet. Yeah, so I think it's important to get the right message across. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. So I think uh, we, we answered quite a lot of the questions. One more uh, coming in, I think it's repeated a couple of times so we, we can clarify for the benefit of everyone um, about the good cholesterol theory that you, you mentioned that it might be a fallacy. So is, is there anything that you would just want to add on to the topic itself? Okay, so uh, let me explain to you why. Uh, so if 20 years ago, I tell you uh, HDL, uh, good cholesterol is a fallacy, I think I'd be considered a heretic, you know? 
people will shoot arrows at me. But so, because the earlier studies were primarily what we call uh, epidemiological studies. So we look at trends. So it's like looking at a trend. Sales of computer, uh, of iPhone go up, cholesterol go up. So both move in the same direction. So you say that sales of iPhone is correlated with, uh, associated with increase in cholesterol. But it doesn't mean if you use your iPhone, your cholesterol will go up. So in the old days, they say that, okay, if your HDL is good, your heart attack is down, so maybe there's some correlation. But later on, subsequent trials were trying to look at causality. So yeah, fine, we see this association, but is there a causation? Is there a causation? So people did what we call randomized control trials, where the doctors don't know what they're giving, the patients also do not know. Uh, they were given placebo and real drugs, and then they were followed up and eventually compared when everything was opened up. And they showed that, true, these drugs could improve the cholesterol 100% uh, increase, but no benefit, did not lower risk of heart attack, did not lower risk of stroke. So after a while, we said, okay, I think we're chasing up a long, wrong tree. So that's why more than 10, year ago, uh, 10 years ago, this was debunked. So I think the, the important thing to focus on is your LDL. And, and the simple uh, you know, message I always tell people, you get LDL down, uh, please drink at least two liters a day because really that is the cheapest way uh, and free of charge uh, to, get a, to prevent a heart attack and a stroke because all, I told you already, almost all heart attacks are due to a blood clot. And actually most strokes are also due to a blood clot. So just by drinking lots of fluid is the cheapest way to prevent a heart attack and a stroke. Thank you, thank you, doctor. So I think a lot of people are keen in the, the scan that you mentioned just now. Roughly, it, what's, the, what's the cost range of uh, the CT scan or, or the, the scan that you mentioned just now earlier on? Okay, and so I think, uh, I think Lavinia will follow up on this, but uh, basically we have, uh, we have two different centers. So one center is an older gener generation machine. I think that scan is quite much, much cheaper than even the government hospitals. Then we have the newer generation uh, scanners. But I'm told that uh, they are working out something special for Propnex, uh, people who are from Propnex. So I think I let the admin people work with Propnex to provide something uh, special for people who are from Propnex. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then I think we would like to just extend to not only Propnex uh, agents, but also to the consumers and Propnex uh, members as well. Sure, uh, sure, doctor, I think it's, it's a really a wonderful session today. It's not easy for me to help to moderate tonight because uh, it's out of my domain. It's a deep expertise today. Uh, thank you, you for all the well. strength. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, but before we end, right, I think I'd just like to invite uh, my CEO, Mr. Ismail, to just yes. say a few words of appreciation. Hi, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael Lim, Dr. Yas Prasad, Dr. Daphne Han, I think I consulted uh, just before the second year, Dr. Daphne Han from my eyes. Michael Lim has been my doctor for the last 10 over years. And um, obviously, if you ask me from the, the modern facilities that Dr. Michael Lim has, in fact, I was looking, unfortunately, I changed my phone. I have my heart in a pristine color condition. Does it look like from an Instagram or something like that? But that was the heart picture that you tweeted me. All I'm trying to tell all the people who are listening here is this first and foremost, thank you doctors for really taking two hours of your time. And today we had more than 1,200 people locked in. Huge number of questions. And the questions exceeded almost more than 60 over. What am I trying to say here is this. In my little experience, as I said, my dad is 95 years. If you ask me, do I want desire to live beyond 100 years? Though it's very exciting. I'd be happy to live well for up to age 80 or 85, being able to move, being not to be stressed. One of the things that I've always felt here is this. People who are more kanchiong, if I use the word, the best thing is to get consulted, consulted, consulted. Rather than we think we are a hero, it will solve by itself. Nothing solved by itself. Every day delayed, it only increase the risk either the pluck or either the vision or either whatever it is, it grows. Therefore, my suggestion to all my loved ones, my prop connections, our fellow customers, just whoever you are comfortable with, people who are out there from education, Dr. Michael Lim, this is the second time he has came and tried to share all these things, just go and consult. Uh, it doesn't cost you much to consult. Then you, if you are not comfortable, take a second opinion. 
what we need is we want all our loved ones to live together, live well, and live healthy. Thank you so much. That's all I wanted to say to every one of y'all. Really, thank, thank you, you so much, Dr. Michael Lim and Dr. Prasad and Dr. Daphne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your host, thank you. Thank you. as well. Yes. Thank you to all the panelists, Dr. Daphne, Dr. Prasad, and Dr. Michael Lim, and everybody's been working hard behind uh, today's session. All the materials are uploaded to MWH uh, Medical's Facebook page. In fact, I ran through their page. There's a lot of information that they are sharing on their page whereby you can benefit as well. In fact, all their clinics, location, contact numbers, even other advices, daily advice is available on their Facebook page, MWH Medical. You can take a photo of this picture and then search on their Facebook page, on their social media. Do help to follow them. It means to all. this session was uh, initiated by, by Dr. Michael to come and share more knowledge to everyone. So with, with that, we'd like to thank everyone. And tonight, I think that's a very significant event. It's not about Promnex, it's about the nation. 8 p.m., the whole nation, the whole Singapore is coming together to sing to for a sing-along. If you see it on all the uh, public media, we're going to sing along to the tune of Home. It's a local made uh, song by one of our local songwriters. So everyone at 8 p.m., all the radio, all the TV station is going to play this song. Hopefully that uh, we wish everybody stay united, stay safe in this difficult time. Singaporean SG United. Thank you. I uh, thank you, MWH Medical. So we hope for, look forward to the next installment and then see everyone very soon. Stay safe. Have fun. Okay, Thank you very much. Stay healthy, stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Likewise.